All right. It's great to be back here in Steadfast. I think the last time I was here about two years ago, um, it's great to see all the, all the new faces in the crowd as well as some of the old ones. And uh, it's a really, really an honor to be here. So thank you, Pastor Shelley, we're, wherever you're at. Uh, you've really been extremely hospitable. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Very hospitable. Thank you for all your generosity and, and, and taking care of us. And thank you all that are here tonight. Uh, I've got a chance to meet so many new people. And uh, it, it really is a, a lot of fun for me. I, I was excited when I heard that he was putting on this event. And even if I wasn't invited to preach, man, I was going to come anyways, yeah. take off some time from work. This is These are the type of events I like to go to and spend my time doing if I can because you know, there's so much fun. I've been repeating this. I've been trying to promote the conference as much as possible. You all are going to get it, or you do get it if you've been coming to these events at all. They're way different being here in person, experiencing the fellowship, hearing the preaching live, singing the songs. you got a great group of people. you got a lot of people that love God all in one place, and there's nothing like it in the world. So um, I'm just extremely happy to be here, and I'm honored that I get an opportunity to, uh, to speak tonight. Now, uh, when Pastor Shelley told me it was going to be a fire-breathing Baptist fellowship, you know, a lot of thoughts go through your mind, especially when you're invited to preach. You know, there's a lot of things you can preach on, and there's a lot of things that deserve some fire-breathing, right? There's, there's perverts in the world that deserve some fire-breathing against. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that you can touch on, but uh, hopefully you came here tonight with a heart to hear that soft and ready to receive because one of the things that came in my mind when I'm thinking about a, um, a fire-breathing sermon, it's one that stings a little bit. It's one that might step on your toes. It's one, you know, I, I didn't come just to step on your toes. I came to step on your foot, okay? <laughs> I, we're not going to stop just at the little bit. I, I want, I'm hopefully the Word of God will be able to pierce through. Don't be one of those people that goes, oh, man, this is a perfect sermon for so-and-so. Right, let's, let's apply the Word of God to your life tonight. I'm going to be hitting on a multitude of topics. There's a lot of different things that I'm going to be covering. And just, just as I preach through God's Word, just think about how can I apply this? Where does this impact me in my life? So that way when you come to a fire-breathing, and, and with all the sermons, I haven't had a chance to hear all of them, but you know, think about how can God's Word change my life so that I can be a better person, I could be a better Christian. And tonight, what I'm focusing on is living above reproach. How can I be a Christian that's above reproach? Now, the word reproach means, and I just got this from the dictionary, but this, this lines up with the Bible definition. The reproach can be used as a verb or as a noun. In the verb form, the, the definition I have here, it says to impute blame to a person for an action or a fault or a rebuke. And then it says the archaic version, which typically is what the Bible's talking about anyways, is to bring disgrace or shame upon. So if you're living above reproach, it means you're living above shame. You're not, you're not bringing a, a bad name or a smear on the name of Jesus Christ because you're living above reproach. Now, the Bible tells us, and, and we're going to come right back here in 1 Peter 4. I'm just going to quote you from 2, Peter, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. The Bible says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. God has, has given us a job to be an ambassador for him. Amen. And this is an important job that, that all believers have. This isn't just a job given to pastors. This isn't just a job given to evangelists. This is a job for every single believer that we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ to reconcile people to God. We are supposed to be going forward and preaching the gospel because guess what? When Jesus Christ came to this earth the first time and he lived his life and he performed his earthly ministry and he died on the cross and rose again from the dead, he ascended up into heaven and that's where he is right now. He isn't still walking around on this earth preaching the gospel and getting people saved in the flesh. He's left us here to do that, and that is every believer's job. Since he's not here, we are supposed to be ambassadors. We are supposed to be bringing forth the gospel. We're supposed to be preaching the word of God. Since he's not here, we are his ambassador. We represent Jesus Christ. Every time you go out, you know what? Every breath that you breathe, you ought to be representative of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is why it's so important to be able to live a life that is above reproach. Because since you are a representative, you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ, we don't want to bring shame on his name. Right. Now, look, I know that none of us here are perfect. 
We're sinful. We're sinners. But that doesn't give you an excuse to go out and sin and to bring shame on the name of Christ. Just because you know that you're not perfect doesn't mean you're not going to strive to be better and to just not bring shame. How about, how about we um, make a concerted effort to do everything we can in our power to be the best ambassador that we can possibly be? Our actions, our character, our spirit will reflect upon the person that we're representing, which is Jesus Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. And, you know, I've been on this challenge kick Pretty much ever since I came here about two years ago is when I issued my first challenge. It was a soul winning challenge. And ever since then, I started instituting more and more challenges in our church. I like the challenge. I don't like just being comfortable and just kind of going through my Christian life and going like, well, I'm going soul winning an hour a week and I'm doing this by right and everything's just, just easy and there's really no, nothing kind of stirring you up a little bit or, or inconvenient, right? I, I like pushing people just enough, not so much where you're just like, oh man, forget this, I can't do it, you know, to the point of just quitting. You don't want the personal trainer that's just going to be like, yeah, that's just wait. <laughs> you're going to bench 600 pounds. Like, yeah, I can't do that. No, but we need to be pushed to keep pushing and getting stronger and going more and more. And I like doing that at our church. we got some church members here. They'll testify. Like, yeah, Pastor Burson is always trying to get us to do more stuff. But um, hopefully we can take some challenges to heart. And tonight, my challenge is just, Look inside yourself. Are you being a good ambassador for Jesus Christ? Are you living a life above reproach? Are you being the best ambassador that you could be? We started off in 1 first, in first Peter chapter 4. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. So I just want to start off differentiating being reproached for Christ versus living a life that brings reproach on the name of Christ. So if you are reproached, if people cast out your name as evil, as your name is wicked, and they say all manner of evil against you falsely because of the stand you take on the Bible, because you're representing Jesus Christ, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that being a bad thing. That's not the living above reproach that I'm referring to. That's a good thing. If people cast out your name as evil, the Bible says, hey, rejoice, leap for joy, be glad because great is your reward in heaven for so did they to the, to the prophets that were before you. That is what we can expect of being reproached by the world because of the belief that we have, because of the word of God, because of the, the stands that we take that are scriptural and biblical. But there's a different type of reproach that you can receive, that you, that you could bring on the name of Christ when you are not following his word, when you're being a hypocrite, when you're bringing shame to the name of Christ because of the way that you live. Let's keep reading here in verse number 14. The Bible says, uh, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Look at verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. So he's saying, you know, when you're reproached for the name of Christ, hey, be happy about that. But don't be suffering because you're a murderer. Don't be suffering because you're a thief and you're stealing and you're stealing from people. You're stealing from your boss on the job. You're stealing in, uh, you know, for, for whatever reason. You're, you're being an evildoer. You're, bringing, you're inflicting harm on people. You're, you're being a busybody in other men's matters. Right? Getting your nose in everyone else's business. Say, you shouldn't be suffering for that. That is reproachful. That is not because of the name of Christ. That is just a reproach because these are shameful things that you can do. Look at verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judge will obey not the gospel of God. So judgment starts here. This is where we need, you know, if you can't expect the nation or the world or anyone else out there to start getting more righteous and to, and to live godly lives if it's not even happening in the house of God. Right. If it's not even happening in the church house, it's, de it's definitely not going to happen anywhere else out in the world. Right. We need to, to bring the judgment back into the, into the house of God. And those were great sermons yesterday from Pastor Fritz and Pastor Major that went over just in depth why the judgment is so important to bring justice and equity and, and starting with the truth, right? Uh, those, are, those are very good points. We need to have, hey, the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Look at verse number 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit 
the keeping of their souls to him and well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 2. Just go back a couple of pages in your Bible. See, Jesus Christ gave us a good example. We're talking about living above reproach. We ought to have a good testimony just in this world. Not just in church, but, and not just before God, but before God and man. It is important to be living a life above reproach. Jesus Christ himself was the example in Luke 2.52. The Bible says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus grew as, as he was getting older before he began his ministry. He's growing in favor, yes, with God, but also with man. Amen. He wasn't known as being a cheat or a crook or a thief or a liar, right? He didn't have some bad reputation as being someone that even the world can look down on, right? He was someone that grew uh, and had favor with God. Three, of course, gives a lot of qualifications for the bishop. And even though you may never be a bishop, you may never fill this office, we can all still look at those qualifications as being, you know, these are, these are minimum requirements for someone to get a job, but these are things that every believer ought to have anyways. I mean, would to God that everybody would be able to fill you know, any of these, these, be committing any of these wicked sins. You at least have to have this standard of, of life before you could be considered for the office of a bishop. And one of them in verse number seven, the Bible reads, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare, a good testimony. You need to be living a way that people aren't going to be able to bring up just, oh, yeah, well, this per that person's going to pass our church. Well, you know he did this and this and this, and just, and just this is how he lives his life, and he lives this wicked life. You need to have a good report of them, which are without. Otherwise, you will fall into reproach. And you think about um, having a good report. Think about a report card. How would you grade yourself having a report card in just... Um, of them that are without. This is, and them that are without, it's referring to not just people within the church, but how about when you leave the church? Because in the church, you may be like, yes, sir, no, sir, you know, praise the Lord, hey, brother, you know, and, and put on all the spiritual talk. But when you leave and go out into the world, how are you behaving yourself? Right. Are you ashamed to run into one of the fellow church members? Or how about when past, you know, you're, you're out in, at, at lunch, on lunch break with one of your work buddies and Pastor Shelley walks in, are you going to be like, hey, God bless you, Yo, right after he's in the news and he's got all these protesters, are you going to be ashamed of Pastor Shelley when he walks in and shake his hand and, and be happy and excited to see him? Or are you going to be like, oh, man, I hope he doesn't come this way? <laughs> right? You ought, you ought to be not be ashamed of the man of God. Now, I'm getting a little bit off point here, but um, when we think about having a good report of them which are without, you know, this is your public life. This is how you act out in public and out in the world. Right. Think about, um, you know, what, what would people in general say about you? You say he's a good person, he's someone they could rely on, someone you could depend on, or it's going to be like, yeah, that guy's no good. He, he never gets anything done right, and, and he's always getting in trouble. He's always got the cops at his house because they're always having arguments at home and everything else. Or is he going to be someone that's, uh, you know, just in general, a good person? Think about your home life. Are you living above reproach at home? How would your family score you? Husbands, how, how would your family score you? Are, you? are you living a life that would be above reproach in the eyes of God and in the eyes of men? Are you, are, are, husbands, are you, are you the head of your household? Are you teaching your children? Are you, are you the spiritual head of your house? Are you teaching your wife and children the Bible? Are you teaching them the word of God? Are you the one in charge? Are you the one making the decisions? How about wives? Are you, are you being the obedient wife that you're supposed to be? It's getting real quiet in here. <laughs> How about it though? Are, are you living above reproach? You know, if you, if you want to claim the Bible and claim the word of God and you really want to stand up and make a difference. Let's not be hypocrites. Let's not pick and choose the parts that we believe in. Let's live above reproach. Let's live in a godly way so that people can look to you and say, wow, there's a good example. There's a good example of what it means to be a Christian. There's someone who's not saying, oh yeah, they, they sound all spiritual, but then yeah, look at their house. They're not, they don't obey the Bible. They're, they're not living the way that God would have them to live. How about children? 
Are you an example of godliness? Are you obeying your parents when you ought to? Are you doing what they tell you to do? Are you just saying you're going to do it and go and just hide and do something else because, you know, they've got, you, you, you could mix in, especially the bigger families, you could mix in with some of the other kids and just pretend like uh, that they're not going to see what you're doing. No, God's going to see everything that you do. We need to be growing in favor with God and man. And we need to be able to live a life that's above reproach. How about on the job? Are you known as someone that's just being real lazy? Are you known as someone that's always taking breaks and just chatting and, and doing anything but work? Are you the guy that comes in and is just like, oh man, we gotta do this again, just complaining and being a murmurer? Or are you the person that comes in and goes, hey, I've got work to do, let's get the job done. I'm not gonna sit around and waste the boss's time. He's paying me money. He's giving me my paycheck and I'm getting paid here to work, so I'm gonna work. Are you gonna be the one that's gonna be dependable and reliable no matter what the job is? Your boss could say, hey, I know that brother so-and-so could do this job. Or they're gonna call you brother, Mr. So-and-so could do this job. And I'm gonna give him that job to do because he's gonna get it done. Because he's gonna get it done ahead of time. He's gonna get it done right. He's not gonna be sloppy and just cut a bunch of corners. He's going to do the right job. Hey, if you're representing Jesus Christ, the Bible says that servants, we ought to work as if we are working for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that in a minute in 1 Peter chapter 2, how we ought to work. Do you work with eye service as a man pleaser? Are you only getting busy and doing your job right when someone's watching you, when your boss is watching you? Or can you just be entrusted for the boss to leave and go out of town and know that you are still going to get your work done? That's how you live above reproach. Because you know what? People ought to know that you're a Christian. People ought to know you believe the Bible. And especially when we're already getting a bunch of flack from the world, people saying, oh, you're in that cult or you're in that hate group. You know what? Why don't you show them a little bit more than what the, the news station's going to show them? Right. You know, we're not... One of the things that, it, even though on one hand, it doesn't really bother me at all when people try to label us, say, oh, you're part of a hate group. Yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, it doesn't really bother me that much, except it really is a miscategorization of what we're all about. And the reason why it doesn't bother me that much is because anyone that, that means anything to me, the people in my life, they know that I'm not just sitting around and like, oh, man, how, who can I hate today? Because that's what it's, when, when people call you a hate group, that's, that's the impression that it's giving off. Like you're just, I'm just sitting around, I'm a hateful person, I'm just trying to hate, and, and man, I just need to find more people to hate. But that's not what it is at all. But see, that's the way that the media will try to make it sound. They're going to make you sound like a bunch of crazies, and, and you have no sympathy, and you don't love people at all. It's the complete opposite. It's, it's totally wrong. So one of the ways that you're going to show that they're wrong is by just doing right. Living faithfully, day in, day out, being consistent and just showing that consistent pattern. And they can say, you know what? I know David. You know, I saw this story on the news, but, but I know him. That's not how he, how he is. Yeah, I know he's got his beliefs. I know he's a Christian. I know he believes the Bible. But they're trying to make him out to be a monster. I know who he is. Right? Are you going to be, or are they going to say, Oh, I know, David. Yeah, that guy's, that guy's never doing his job. That guy's going on gambling sites instead of doing work. That guy's going off and, you know, hi, I find him hiding in the closet instead of, instead of doing his job. Right. Our actions are going are gonna to really speak a lot louder than our words are, especially for those that know you. Right. And we cannot be bringing a reproach on the name of Christ. And then how about in church? How do people view you in church? Are you faithful? Are you showing up to all the services? Are you, are you someone that can be relied on and be dependable and, and, and just be a servant? Be a servant of the Lord? Be a servant for the church? Be a minister? Be here, excuse me, to, to help other people out instead of just, oh, well, what, what activities you got for me? Right? How, how can this church, well, what? Come on, what can you do for me, church? Do you got something for my kids to do? Do you guys? How about you come in and come in and serve the church? Amen. We ought to live a life above reproach so that no one has anything, any evil report to say of you that's going to bring down the name of Christ. You're in 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse number 11. The Bible reads, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, 
abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul having your conversation honest among the Gentiles there's again the same point that I'm making honest among the Gentiles when it's talking about the Gentiles it's just talking about the heathen it's talking about people who are without you know the world out there you ought to have your your conversation isn't just the words that come out of your mouth it's the way that you live it's an older word but it's just it's basically the way that you live your life you ought to have your conversation honest among the Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, right? The world is going to speak against you as an evildoer. Oh man, that guy, yeah. Because they hate God or they hate Christianity, they're going to try to come up with all manner of lies against you. Right. He's saying, you have your conversation honest. Right. You just be on the up and up. You live above reproach because they're going to say bad things about you. Right. So you better not let those things be true. Because that, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. It's going to make an impact on the day of visitation when you go to them and bring the gospel. Hey, oh yeah, well yeah, I do know that person that's a Christian. I do know that person that, you know, they try to say all evil against them, but nothing's sticking. Your good works, which they're going to see, is going to give more evidence to the, to the truth and the verity of the faith. Look at verse number 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. And without getting really deep into this, in general, we ought to just not just cause a bunch of problems because you want to be contrary to just everything that the, you know, I, look, I'm not for big government. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of things where they overstep their bounds and, and they just act outside of the authority that God's given them. But in general here, you know, we ought to just be able to, to get along and just, and just go like Jesus said, you know, pay the trip. You know, are we supposed to pay the tribute money? No, the children are free. But you know what? Just go ahead and do it anyways. Like whatever. They could have their stinking money. Render unto Caesar, Caesar that which is Caesar's. Right? That's the way we, just, we ought to be able to live so that they don't just have this extra sticking point. Oh, yeah, well, he's a tax evader. Right? We don't need to give them any ammo. If there's, if there's nothing that's, that's, you know, contradicting God's word and there's nothing that's just, um, you know, a real problem there. Let's just, let's just go ahead and live above reproach. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You want to know what the will of God is? Well, here's one example of the will of God. What's the will of God? That you can just do good and that with your well-doing you're going to put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. We heard some foolish men referenced Yesterday, you know, the people who want to bring up the shellfish and, and oh, you know, there's that mixed fabric, you know, and all the typical atheist talking points. Those are foolish men. But you know what? Your well-doing can just put to silence their ignorance. That's why you don't, you don't have to answer verbally all of these foolish men that are bringing these foolish arguments. You can just ignore them and let your works do the talking for you. With your good works, with your well-doing, you're going to put to silence their ignorance because they don't know anything. They're going to rail on you. They're going to bring false accusations. You know what? You just keep doing good and right. Amen. Bible says in verse 16, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Look, hey, praise God, we're free in Christ. That we're saved. And there's nothing that's going to damn you once you've accepted the free gift of eternal life. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. But now let's not use that liberty as a cloak, as a covering just to be malicious. Right. We need to have, we need to be as the servants of God. Let's use that liberty being a servant of God. Look at verse number 17. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. And, and this is where the rubber meets the road. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. He makes a point of saying, look, I'm telling you, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. Now you say, servant, master, what are you talking about? Are you talking about slaves here? No. How about if you are working for somebody, he's the boss, you're the employee, that's your master and you're the servant. What's a servant? You're serving. 
What is it when you go out to eat and someone comes to the table? They're called a server, right? right? Why? Because they're serving you. No, it doesn't. Then you don't have to be serving someone food to be a servant. And he says here, look, be subject to those. They have authority over you. They're your boss. Be subject unto them. He says, and not only to the ones that are good, not only the ones that are nice and treat you with respect and, and talk nice to you, he says, but also to the froward. That's how you act godly. That's how you live above reproach. It's not a tit for tat. Oh, well, he doesn't respect me, so I'm not going to respect him. That's not the attitude that God has given us as Christians. Amen. That's not the attitude that Jesus Christ had. Amen. If Jesus Christ had that attitude, we'd all go to hell. Right. Because he suffered the contradiction of sinners against himself. He came with humility right. and out of love to give us a free gift to purchase our salvation that we don't deserve at all. And every single time we break any of God's commandments, we're showing God disrespect. Right. We don't deserve his grace and mercy, but he gives it to us anyways. We ought to have a Christ-like attitude in every aspect. That's the only way we're going to be able to live above reproach. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 19, for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. And what he's saying here is that, you know, what glory is it? You can't really glory if you're being punished, if you're buffeted for your fault. I mean, you do wrong and then you have to pay for it and then you take it. Well, of course, you, you better take it because you did wrong. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that there's, there's no glory in that. You don't get any reward for, oh, well, I took my reward patiently. Well, you did wrong. Of course, you deserve that. That's what you should get. Right. He's saying, but when you do well, when you're doing what's right and you're not an evildoer, but you're still being punished as an evildoer, but you still take it patiently. He says, that's thankworthy. Amen. That's a godly attribute. That's a way that your actions can speak very loud and speak volumes. And that's a way you can live above reproach that people say, well, man, that guy, even when he's wrongfully accused, even when he's just suffering as an evildoer, he still has integrity. He's still able to live a godly life and show an example of how Jesus would have you to live. Bible says in verse number 21, for even hereunto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. He's the perfect example. Look at how much Christ suffered for us and, and didn't look at what it says in verse number 23. Or excuse me, verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Verse 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Now, this is not always easy to put into practice, as is most of the Bible, right? The Bible is, I think, very, by and large, easy to understand. God did not give us a list of complicated commandments that it's just, man, what is he trying to tell us here? I don't know. This is so difficult. No one can even understand. Look, it's very easy. God's list of do's and don'ts, he didn't make it complicated. You don't have to be, you know, even a theologian could figure it out. <laughs> they ought to be able to. I think most of the time they get it wrong because they reject the word of God by and large. But it's so easy. I mean, children can understand these commandments. They're not hard. The only hard thing is putting them into practice. Jesus Christ, when he was reviled, what does it mean to be reviled? I got another dictionary definition for you. It's to use abusive or scornful language against someone or something. So someone's just, just really railing on you. Someone's just bringing just, just really bad language about, against you, scorning you. The Bible says that when he was reviled, when Jesus was reviled, he didn't revile back. He didn't just go ahead and say, oh, yeah, well, you know, you're this, you're that. And when people were just, just railing on him as the son of God, he just let it be. And it's your pride that's going to cause you to feel like you just have to defend yourself and then cut the other. You, know, you cut me down. Well, I'm going to cut you down even worse. Oh, you're trying to hurt me with your words? Well, let me hurt you even worse. That is a fleshly attitude. And that is, that is not a good example of living above reproach. Look, you want to be above reproach because people are going to hear those words and be like, well, I heard you saying this. 
what makes you any better than them? You're not. But when you can be reviled and revile not again, when you can suffer and threaten not, I mean, Jesus didn't threaten when, as he was being punished wrongfully. He could have at any moment. I mean, think, who else could threaten any more than Christ? But he didn't. He suffered it. He allowed it. He didn't revile again. How about you? Now, this goes to even our words, right? And, and our words is what I'm going to spend the rest of the time kind of focusing on. There's a lot of actions that we can do that, that are very important the way that we live. But I think when it comes to our mouth and controlling our tongue and controlling our words, this is where the vast majority of people, I think, have a problem with it. I'm not saying there's not a problem in other areas of your life and other actions, but this is a problem with everybody. This is a problem that the Bible says a problem with anyone. It's, it's such a problem. You know, James 3, 2 says, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Right. He's saying if you're, if you're able to not offend in your word, you're perfect. I don't know anybody that's perfect <laughs> other than Jesus Christ. This is, this is a big deal. In many things we offend all. And controlling your tongue is extremely important. Look at verse, well, you could turn to James 3 if you'd like. But when we live above reproach and you think about your words, first of all, before we even get into the damage that your words can cause, just think about this. Do people take you seriously when you speak? Are you always just joking around and no one can really take you seriously? Or are you the type of person that's able to, to make promises or say things and then you're not true to your word? Are you faithful? Are you dependable? This is an important point, and I didn't have this as, as such a big point in my notes, but what is it that we get saved by? Which by? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. How does God treat his word? God's word is holy. God's word is, does God ever lie? Are we going to find anything that is not true or does not come to pass in God's word? No. God made the world through his word. God made everything through his word. Jesus Christ is the word. So you want to talk, take a talk about the status, the elevation of God's word? It's everything. And in the end, when it comes down to it in this life, what are we left with but our word? who we are. It doesn't consist of the things that we have. That doesn't matter. You could have physical things here today, gone tomorrow. Amen. So you need to make sure that when you say something, it's going to stand. Amen. And then if people are going to know you, as, if nothing else, if they're going to know you by one thing, how about, well, I know that when Pastor Burson says something, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come to pass. And not in the sense that, like, look, I'm not saying I'm God. But just if I'm going to open up my mouth to something, if I'm going to say something, then hopefully I can live my life in a way that I am treating my word with reverence, trying to be godly. Because God's word is revered. God's word, I mean, there is nothing that can be said against God's word. Amen. It comes to pass every time. We ought to be living our life above reproach so that way you can own all the words that come out of your mouth and stand by it and, and not have anything said amiss or like I said it in error, right? When God's holding you responsible for your vows that you made, say, oh, you say it not before an angel, I said it in error. Well, I didn't mean to say that. Look, think before you speak. Amen. Think before you speak. Yeah. That'll solve a lot of problems. Right. Yeah. And these days, it's it's... It's how easy it is to get this big megaphone and just broadcast every thought that comes into your mind to the world right. in, in, in a few seconds. Right. Yep. You can just, something pops in your head, hey, I'm sorry, I'm out. Look, this, look at James 3. Hopefully you turn to James chapter 3. And this is way before social media and the internet and the ability to just reach so many people. Look at verse number five in James three. The Bible says, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And, and what the Bible is doing is likening your small tongue, 
right? Our tongue in, in relation to our body is very small. There's wildfires all over the country. You, know, you think about in California, we have wildfires. In Arizona, we have wildfires. And oftentimes, these huge fires that are really devastating and destroy homes and destroy just thousands of acres of land are started by something really small, like a cigarette butt or you know, a lightning strike or just, just someone building a campfire and, and it just a spark goes you know, flying off the fire, whatever. Just a little bit can, can cause huge amounts of damage and just devastating destruction just with that little bit of fire, that little spark just to set off this huge uh, disaster. And the Bible is likening our tongues to, to a small fire. Look at uh, verse number six. The Bible says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. What's iniquity? It's sin. Your tongue's like a world of sin. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. Say, man's able to tame every type of animal. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. We are receiving very, very dire warning about our tongues. Let's take it to heart tonight and let's learn to try to temper our tongue. And our think about this verse, think about these verses about your, your tongue being a fire or a world of iniquity and, and take it seriously. This is a serious warning. This is strong language. You know, the Bible uses strong language on things that God is trying to stress and make a really important point about. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I couldn't think of a better way of trying to explain the amount of destruction that can be caused by just saying a few words than likening it to a fire that causes tons of destruction. When that becomes real to you and you think about that, I mean... Marriages are destroyed over just maybe a few words that people can say. It happens. People say things that they shouldn't have said. Dam real damage can be done just using your words. And, you know, your words are powerful. The devil knows this, which is why he's always trying to shut out and stamp out the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to divide asunder between the soul and the spirit. God's word is able to save God's word is important, so, and it's powerful. Our words also are powerful, but are you going to use it for good or for evil? And if you don't have control over your tongue, you can cause a lot of damage. There's a lot of sins that are associated with your tongue. You think of backbiting, you think of gossiping, or railing, or tailbearing. Yep. Right, right. Yep. These things become rampant. These are, and these are all serious sins. Yeah. These aren't just little things. They cause a lot of damage in people's lives. Amen. Men's character is, is ruined. Men, people's characters could be completely ruined over gossiping and tail bearing. And, you know, you can't get that back. All it takes is some false accusation to just smear somebody's name, smear some good man's name, and their character gets to be ruined and shot over, over someone telling stories. We ought to be real careful about the things that you speak and about the things that you say and the things that you repeat and the slanders or railing that might be going on, especially against men of God that might be doing a good work over something that you heard second or third hand somebody say and you don't really know for yourself. Amen. Don't go spreading that stuff. Don't go spreading that garbage. Right. Keep control over your tongue. Yeah, it might sound real juicy and you just want to just tell everybody. Get some control over yourself. Have some integrity, and how about the words that you say you can back up? Because you're only going to speak truth. Because you're going to speak what's right, and you're not going to just say everything that you've heard and just repeat it all. People need to learn to show some discernment when speaking, and especially making those public statements. Now, one thing I'm really happy to see was, you know, along with the sermons we heard yesterday, is the resurgence of men that are bringing judgment back into churches. Right? It's good. We need it. 
I'm sick of these churches that just, there's no judgment at all. Oh, judge not. And, and, and everything's tolerated and everything's acceptable and, and you can't, no one can judge anything. You get sick of it. It's nauseating. But praise God for people who are willing to, to stand up and breathe fire and say, hey, there is judgment. Amen. God tells us that there ought to be judgment and judgment starts in the house of God. Right. And the Bible says, and this was quoted yesterday, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. When you're spiritual, when you walk in the spirit, when you have the spirit of God, when you have the law of God, you can judge all things. And, but then when it follows up with, yet he himself is judge of no man, how can man judge you if you're walking in the spirit, if you're walking in the will of God, if you're living and walking according to God's word? There is no other judgment against that. But in order to be judged of no man, you can't be hypocrites in your judgment. Right. Yep. You have to be in the spirit. <laughs> you're, 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 you're doing what you're, what you're saying. It's the same judgment that's going to apply to you. So when you see or witness people, how about this, people railing, do you then become a railer? Do you just start railing on the person that, that you find out to be a railer? Think about it. When, when you hear about these things, do you just, just open up your mouth now and, and decide to get involved and, and be like a, a, you know, someone that wants to get involved and meddle and, and strife not belonging unto you? Be careful with your words. Now, you know, there may be a lot of things that you think about and you, you, you keep inside, but you don't want to just go and... and you see one thing happen and just blow up and blow off your mouth and start spouting off on things that you really have no business doing to. We need to be careful with what you say and do. And you got to remember this, there's a magnifying glass on you from the world. Yeah. Because that they can't stand mm -hmm. on the judgments of God. That makes them really infuriated and in what they want to do, they want to point out all of your problems on where you don't believe the word of God to show you as a hypocrite because if they could demonstrate that you're just some big hypocrite, then they could blow you off because your words have no meaning. Right. And it's true, it's going to devalue anything that you say. Why should anyone believe you if you're just going to say one thing and do another? I'm not going to listen to a person like that. For so many, for so many times I've been into churches and Baptist churches and you hear one thing preached and then you see the guy doing something completely opposite. That, that doesn't help the cause at all. We need to be able to live above reproach. But we also need to be very careful because of this magnifying glass and because they're going to be focusing on you because of your beliefs. And we don't want to be so overcome with our own zeal and our own, you know, just, just being fired up about the, the, the righteous judgment that we end up erring in judgment and we end up getting a wrong spirit as well. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, the Bible says in J, turn if you would to Psalm 15. Psalm 15. In James chapter 1, the Bible says in verse number 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. We ought to be ready to hear. At all times, you're swift to hear. You know, people are talking, I'm going to be listening. But you're slow to speak because you need to be able to process what you hear. We ought not to just be reactive and get all emotional when you hear something you don't like. You know, take a minute to process it before you respond if it even requires a response. Not everything requires a response. And not everyone that says something that's going to make you angry deserves a response. Right. You need to be able to show discretion and some discernment on when it's appropriate and when it's not. And you, not, you ought not to be someone who's real quick to wrath. We ought to be slow to wrath. I mean, thank God, God is slow to wrath. God is long-suffering. God's not just flipping on a hairpin trigger as soon as someone does something wrong and he's just pouring out wrath on people. No, he's long-suffering, and we ought to be too. Don't let yourself, your, your own righteousness, as you try to get sin out of your life, lift you up so much to now you think that you're so much holier than thou that now, oh man, I can't be, you can't say anything like that in front of me. I'm just going to flip on people and flip out and go in a rage because 
people do something wrong or, or someone said something amiss. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Psalm 15, we're going to see also just having and using proper judgment. Proper judgment, because... Again, while I'm happy and, and thrilled and excited about great doctrine being preached and a lot of the doctrine that comes out, some people are very unfamiliar with and it's not being taught as widely as it used to be maybe and it's newer to some people, but then you, have, uh, you end up having some confusion and people in their zeal because, man, you hear something true, you hear something good and you get fired up about it. Oftentimes, people can end up using that and applying it inappropriately. And what I'm referring to specifically has to do with the reprobate doctrine, okay, where people can become rejected by God Amen. and they've crossed the line and they are no longer have any, you're sealed, you're secure, amen. A child of God, everlasting life. Well, there's some people that they become children of the devil. Yep. And look, we can't be unborn from being children of God and these reprobates can't be unborn from being children of the devil. Right. It's something that happens that's permanent, okay? But we need to be able to show proper discernment and discretion and understanding when it comes to people like that and not misapplying people that are in that category. It does impact the way that you deal with people. Right. If you're dealing with someone that you think is a reprobate versus someone who's just unsaved, there is a whole world of difference in how you treat that person. Amen. So we cannot be just real quick on a hair trigger to just, oh, reprobate, 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 reprobate. Look, show some discernment. I know you haven't heard this maybe your entire life going to churches about this doctrine for whatever reason, but let's not mis misapply good doctrine. And let's look at Psalm 15. I'm going to show you a little bit what I'm talking about here. The Bible says in verse number one, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. And this is what I'm talking about, just living above reproach, right? You're walking uprightly, working righteousness, speaking the truth in his heart. Verse number three, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Now it brings up things that you can do with your tongue, right? Backbiting, doing evil, and then taking a reproach against your neighbor, right? Just, just, bringing these, these shameful things and, and, and just applying them to, to this other guy, to your neighbor, to some other person. And he's saying, you shouldn't be doing those things. And don't be stirring up this trouble and just bringing out these accusations or whatever against these random people. But then look at verse number four. It says, in whose, eye a vile per in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. That means hated. So on the one hand, you can't be backbiting and taking up a reproach against certain people, but then he's saying a vile person is hated. Right. A vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. And we need to have the proper balance of hating, like the Bible says here, a vile person a vile person like a reprobate, like a pedophile, okay, someone who's just really wicked like that, they're hated, they're contemned. We need to balance that, though, with the rest of Scripture. It says that we're not supposed to be have hatred in our heart and be hateful people and just hating all the time because that is not of God. Right. There is a, a, a small amount of time. There is a time to hate, the Bible says. Yeah. But that shouldn't characterize who you are. And you also shouldn't just misapply the, the, the godly, righteous, contemning and hatred and just start applying that in many other areas that's just, just completely unfounded. And just start hating a bunch of unsaved people, but they're not reprobate. Right. It's not, they're not the vile person. Okay, we're supposed to love the lost and preach the gospel to them. Now, the vile person, they can go to hell. They're hated. The reprobate's going to go to hell. And nothing I do or you do is going to change that. But we need to remember and take heed to what spirit that we have. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9.
And you hear preaching on, on reprobates, man, that gets fiery. Right? You, you, you read and, and preach the word of God and, and how the wrath of God is going to come out. That's real fiery. And, and it stirs people up. Some people get stirred and real angry about it. You know, it, just, it, it, it brings a lot of emotion. But let's make sure that we don't allow that to just get into other areas of our life that it doesn't belong. Look at what happens here in Luke chapter 9 with Jesus and his disciples. We're going to start reading in verse number 49. The Bible reads, And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. And we need to be careful, especially... In, in this new movement that, that a lot of people are excited about, in this new independent fundamental Baptist movement, that it doesn't just get super cliquish. Because even Jesus Christ, I mean, if you think about anyone who had a right to say, no, you have to be just with my group or else you're out, Jesus Christ could have said that. Right? right. right? I mean, who else can say that? Like, no, if you're not in with my group, then you're out. Okay, Jesus could say that, but you know, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. He's, John's like, hey, we saw this guy casting out devils, but he's not following with us here. So we forbid, say, we forbid him. Jesus said, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. He said, he's still on our team. Okay, he may be somewhere else. He may be off in another church, but he's not against us. Amen. He's still on the same team. And we don't need to be starting making these extra divisions that don't need to be there for any reason of people who are on our team. People who are serving God. I mean, this guy is serving God. He's casting out devils. I don't think Jesus would be talking about uh, someone who's for us, that's not saved, that's not doing something for God, right? And, and he's saying, don't forbid him. So let's, let's be careful. Yes, we want to call out bad doctrine. Yes, we want people to, to be inspired and, and do soul winning and get into God's word and, and you know, have good doctrine. But let's be careful not to get too clickish with it. Look at verse number 51. We're going to keep reading here. But it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? So Jesus is looking for a place to stay, and he's going to go into this village of Samaria, of the Samaritans, right? He's, but he's on his way to Jerusalem. So when they find out that he's on his way to Jerusalem, because there's this conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans, they're just like, well, no, we're not going to put you up. Yep. You know, just, just go to Jerusalem then. Right? They didn't want to have him. So James and John, they're like, well, <laughs> they're not receiving you, Jesus. Should we just call fire down on these people because they're not letting you stay with them for the night? Because they're being inhospitable to you? They're not, they're not receiving you? And what does Jesus say to them? Look what it says in verse 55. It says, but he turned and rebuked them. So were they, were, was this a righteous zeal that they had of like, man, just, let's just call the fire of God down on these, on these wicked Samaritans and let God judge them. Jesus rebuked them. He said, no. Now, look, we need to be careful not to have this hellfire damnation attitude just get overwhelming of just apply, or just, just forget everyone could just go to hell. Let's just call fire down anyone who disagrees with us, anyone who's not showing us kindness. God just smite them and, and you know, look, be careful with that. While there are specific times and places where, you know, hating would be okay or imprecatory prayer is okay, it's not just like, well, you know, they didn't, they, they didn't receive me, so let's just kill them, right? I mean, let's, let's not get overboard with, uh, with these areas, and it's important. And, and <clears throat> if people would just be careful with what they say and not just real quick, to spouting off, then a, a lot of these problems can be solved and not going overboard in this stuff. 
if you're newer to the doctrines, learn them a little better before you start teaching them. Okay, you could, you could listen and learn, but before you go publicly and just try to teach the world on, every, on, on all these things that you just learned yesterday, make sure you know them before you start to teach them. Now you can point them to other teachers, great. People who have, who have studied and learned and are able to explain it very well and, and can answer these things and know more the ins and outs of the, of the doctrines, great. That's why God has given teachers in the church because it's not just a free for all. We're not just having every person come up here and go, oh, let's just see what you have to say. <laughs> what are you going to teach us tonight? Because not everybody's a teacher. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay? And for, and for very good reason. Because not everyone knows the scripture well enough to be a teacher of the scripture. Right. I mean, Paul rebuked people, hey, for the time, you ought to be teachers. You, even, you might have been saved for a long time. And for how long time it's been, you ought to be teachers, but you're babes. And you need milk, not strong meat. And it's a shame. And it's sorry, but that's the truth in many cases. So if you're a babe and you need milk and you can't handle the strong meat, don't go around trying to be, you know, wear the big boy pants and tell everyone else and serve up a meal for them. Just take the milk. And look, there's nothing wrong with a baby being a baby, right. but a baby shouldn't be a baby for 20 years. Right. Baby needs to grow. And that's one of the key differences between physical and spiritual. Physical, the baby's going to grow. Or it's going to die, right? If, you don't, if, if it's not fed, the baby will just die. Otherwise, it's going to grow. Right. Spiritually, though, you could, you could be going day after day after day, and you're still a baby. You need to get fed. You need to learn. You need to grow. Right. But, but don't go trying to teach you. Like, hold, hold that thought. Just, just keep it inside until the time is appropriate when it comes to teaching on stuff. Um, turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. I'll, I'll finish off the story for you in Luke chapter 9. I don't think I read the rest of the verses. When they wanted to call fire and brimstone down from heaven, verse 55 says, But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went to another village. Just remember the purpose. Remember the goal, what we're, what we're here to. Don't, don't, get, don't get wrapped up in any one doctrine, especially if it's one that's contrary. To, you know, some people just kind of glory, I think, in the attention and just revel in, oh, man, I just like making people upset. You got those trolls out there, right, that like to go on YouTube channels and just throw out these comments. They're just going to make people just real mad and upset. Don't be that guy. Uh, you preach a sermon, don't be that guy, right? Did you bring that up or no? I don't remember. Was that what, one of your points of not being a guy that's just going in there to stir up trouble? Look, we ought not to be that guy. Amen. Don't be someone that's coming to these churches and you're coming, oh, man, I'm going to, because I just want to get people riled up and upset. That's not the goal. Great. Look, the word of God is going to offend. The word of God is going to get people mad and upset. But let the word of God do that. You don't need to go and, and add anything to it or, or only be focused on making people upset. If it happens, it happens. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 29, the Bible reads, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. This is the spirit that ought to just dictate your life. And, 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 and the, the attitude that we ought to have just 99% of the time or 100% of the time, and this is the attitude we ought to have, but Obviously, there's time when false prophets need to be called out. There's times when reprobates need to be identified. There's times even when uh, church discipline needs to be enforced on people and things need to come to light, right? And that's why a man of God will call those things out and do so appropriately and, and not hold anything back, and, and, and it is what it is, right? And there's some, you know, false prophets, reprobates, they need to be 
railed against as just being extremely wicked, evil people to get the warning out there of how bad they really are. That needs to happen. That's appropriate. But you know what's not appropriate is a brother or sister in Christ who may be in error and may be in, in grievous error of committing a sin, maybe a sin found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that talks about putting away that wicked person from among you, right? And executing church discipline. But we need to be careful that we're not applying hatred to the person that is guilty of a sin, even if it's a bad sin, if they're, if they're a brother in Christ. The Bible says in... Um, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, there's an example of people that you're supposed to withdraw yourselves from, people who won't work, people who are acting disorderly. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 12, I'll read this for you. The Bible says, Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. There's some people, because of their sin, because of their lack of work, because of their drunkenness, because of whatever, they, they need to be ashamed. Yeah. Yeah. You need to be withdrawn from them, not eat with them. Okay, They need to, to, to endure and suffer for their wrongdoing and take it patiently. But the Bible says, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Right. Right. He's not your enemy. Now, the, 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 the false, these deceivers that creep in unawares, that try to pretend like they're one of you, that try to pretend like they're a sheep, but it turns out they're a false prophet and they're a wicked person, those aren't the people I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone that, they're a brother, they're a sister, and you know what? Hopefully they'll be restored. Amen. So what we don't want to do, what we don't want to do is when these things happen, is just unleash everything that you've ever thought about that person and just throw it out on the internet because, oh, now they're not part of our church, so I'm just going to start throwing everything out there that I've ever heard about this person. Look, if it's not some wicked reprobate, what's the purpose of doing that? Amen. What, what is the goal? Does it make you feel better to just, to just throw out then a whole bunch of smear on, on somebody that's already, look, they're already getting kicked out. We ought to not hate that person, but pray that, you know, they will be restored. Yeah. Man. God is ready to forgive. Yeah. Don't forget that. Because don't forget, you may find yourself in a situation that you commit some sin. How would you want to be dealt with? Now, look, if I commit some grievous sin, I need to be put away from the church or I need to step down faster. I accept that because I want to have a righteous judgment. I don't want to be a hypocrite and say, oh, well, it applies to them, but not to me. But at the same point, if I end up being repentant, I don't want to just have like, oh, man, but everybody hates me, and I've had all kind of slander and evil just spoken against me for other things that I didn't even do after I've already been punished for what, for what I need to be punished for. And I don't think anyone's even going to want to take me back now because apparently everybody hated me anyways. <laughs> right? I mean, who's going to want to come back to a place of just, well, man, yeah, that, look. Apply things appropriately. Good. Right? Apply it appropriately. It, it's, it's, it's really not that difficult, but if you don't know, and look, if, someone gets hit, if you don't know, you don't need to add to the conversation. Just keep it to yourself. Amen. Amen. I'm going to close with this. 3 John chapter 1, going back to the idea, we're, in, we're supposed to be good ambassadors for Christ. Let's live above reproach. 3 John, verse number 3, the Bible says, For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Living above reproach, that's walking in truth. Amen. Walking in righteousness. Walking in honesty. Any parent here physically that has children can tell you that when you see your child walking in truth, walking in righteousness, having their own relationship with God, 
Nothing brings more joy than that. Amen. That is awesome to have a child doing that. And not just your physical ch child. How about someone you lead to Christ? Right. How about somebody that you invest your time in and you're, you're, you're training them and teaching them and discipling them. And then you go away for a while and you come back and you're like, oh man, hey, it's great to see you. You're walking in truth. Praise the Lord. That's great. That brings a lot of joy. Amen. And how much joy do you think the heavenly father has? When he sees his children, and this applies to everybody individually, when he sees you walking in truth, there's no greater joy. Let's make our Heavenly Father happy with us individually. Let's live lives above reproach. Let's take God's word and apply it as appropriate in our life. Let's heed our tongues. Let's, let's take heed to our actions and, and live in such a way that the, we could put to silence the ignorance of foolish men because they have nothing evil to say about us because we're living according to God's word. Amen. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your, your clear instructions and the simple instructions, Lord, to help us as sinful humans to be able to put them into action in our life. God, I pray that you please bless this church. Bless everyone here tonight, dear God. Help us. Uh, we have a heart to serve you, Lord, and, and help us to, to get right. We want to be pleasing in your eyes, help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.